she was uh, running the world. Uh, next, we have Sheila Baer. She's the former chairman of the FDIC. She's written a book, uh, take, I think it's Take the Bull by the Horns. And that has to do with the market and other things. And it's a metaphor, and it's literal. And I welcome her and Steve Clemens. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, great to be with all of you this morning. I am here with uh, uh, someone I admire a great deal. Uh, doesn't mean we're not going to have an easy interview. <laughs> uh, but with Sheila Baer, who was the 19th uh, chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, I first met Sheila when she was counsel to Bob Dole. She had a reputation of being a no-nonsense, very tough, uh, occasionally abrasive, not that abrasive uh, person, hardcore Republican. And then, lo and behold, the financial crisis hit, and you didn't play to script. Uh, to a certain degree, uh, you became essentially a heroine of those people whose homes had been foreclosed on and that you essentially uh, saw as victims of a structural corruption that hit, hit Washington. You've now written a book. I was asked last night uh, by someone here, what books was I reading? And I said, Bull by the Horns. And I'm going to show it up because it is an incredibly riveting um, fascinating history of the players and politics behind the financial crisis, who did what to whom. And you're withering in your criticism of Larry Summers, who spoke here yesterday, of Tim Geithner. Um, and you give us a picture of the fact that while we may have escaped some of this crisis, there's a lot of concern that you still hold today about our, about our system. So can you tell us a little bit about this snapshot? And, and I think there's still anger. At least that's what I feel, at least in the beginning of the book. Well, I, I think there is, and I, I would like to say uh, I am uh, perhaps withering, uh, but it's criticism of policy positions that were taken. I don't question anyone's motives in the book. I think everyone was doing what they thought was right and what was the best interest of the country during the crisis, but there were some, uh, some very profound uh, policy differences, and it's no secret I thought the focus was too much on the big banks and, and stabilizing them and giving them a lot of generous subsidies, uh, which we did. Uh, and they got, they became healthy again. They were paying their bonuses again very quick. And we took a much more limited view of helping homeowners. Uh, the programs uh, were, uh, were too limited. They were too complicated. Uh, they weren't enough of a priority. And uh, as a result, uh, I think uh, it, it, it hurts the economic recovery now. We never really dealt effectively with housing and the mortgages, the delinquent and, uh, and uh, distressed mortgages that were at the root of the crisis. Uh, you know, the theory was you help the big banks, you help the broader economy. It just didn't work out that way. I mean, but you, you, you say very clearly in this that taxpayer dollars were used to uh, cushion the blow for banks right. that otherwise weren't really in danger of falling. I, I don't think that's, I think that's right. There was a liquidity problem, uh, clearly towards the end of 2008, uh, but in terms of needing capital, uh, I, I think uh, there were a couple of institutions that were outliers. The rest of them, I think, uh, could have bumbled through, and even the liquidity support was very, very generous. Um, and uh, so... Uh, you know, it is what it is, and especially at the end of 2008, we didn't have good information, and so your instinct is to just throw a lot of money at it, because if you do less, uh, the consequences could be quite severe. If you do more, you're going to regret it, as, as I do. Uh, but at the time, that seemed like the right decision. But I do think going into 2009, once we'd stabilized the system, we could have done more to impose accountability, and we just didn't do it. And just a little one left bit on the personality side of this. Sure. You um, also describe how Larry Summers didn't take the FDIC's concerns to the president or misrepresented right. those concerns. Right. Yeah. When you saw this and you saw this club of guys right. that you talk about, when right. you, you know, the, read the opening chapter, it's fascinating. Right. October 2008, you talk about walking into this room. You said I, that you weren't going to be shaking, that no, you weren't going to be intimidated. <laughs> yeah, and, right. and, um, but you describe it as something that you realized was, was a bit of a, a, a network that had to be upended. What were the mechanisms you used to get your message out? How did, I mean, from a political perspective, right. we're in Washington, the Washington Ideas Forum, but this is also a story right. here about power and how you right. deploy it. Well, we always tried to uh, resolve these internally first. I think we, we did go to uh, the press, and uh, at times, uh, a lot of the times, information was leaked about our proposals. That was what was going on in late You thought the press was sort of irresponsible and sensationalist. Well, and, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, actually, I, I would give a net positive mark to the press because uh, I had my disagreements with them, but overall, I do think uh, they did report some of these fundamental policy disputes, which was important. But there were times, uh, and I think this does uh, tend to happen more with uh, women uh, political leaders, uh, that uh, 
when we voice a disagreement or we have a different view than what maybe the group think, uh, you know, we're difficult, <laughs> you know, or it's trivialized, or there's regulators squabbling again. And there were a few times when I thought uh, we were trying to uh, get a message across on the need to deal with the structural problems with the mortgages, where it was just, oh, Sheila Bear being difficult. Uh, so that was frustrating, and I think it's something uh, the uh, media needs to guard against. I will say, too, I think, though, you know, headlines. I think some of it was editors, perhaps more than reporters, you know, a headline that says people are fighting with each other, kind of getting into personality stuff, it may sell more newspapers than, you know, uh, you know, Bear and Geithner disagree on risk retention for securitization. You know, maybe that doesn't sell as so many papers, but that's really, you know, one of the many issues where we had uh, different, different approaches. So let's fast forward to today. Today we have, you know, we're going to do... Uh, some brinksmanship over fiscal cliff right. issues, but I don't want to forget um, you know, the, the person who, through no fault of their own, saw a change in their financial circumstances, foreclosures right. across the country. Right. We still have today so many homes underwater. Yeah. Um, so if you were running the show today, what, what do you think is undone right. uh, in well, the package? What's not I, I getting think addressed? There, there's still a lot of unreal, unrealized losses in the housing market. Uh, there are even... Uh, the, the number of distress, there's still a lot of uh, distress. Unrealized markets, losses so. in the housing unrealized market. Unrealized losses, yeah. just in terms of there's a huge uh, backup of shadow inventory, uh, homes that are either in foreclosure or on their way to foreclosure or, or seriously delinquent. There are a lot of uh, significantly underwater mortgages. That problem eases a bit if, if the trajectory for home prices continues to rise and people may think twice mm -hmm. about sticking with it. It uh, depends on how deeply underwater they are. But I think, you know, one of the things we had pushed, uh, at least for the delinquent loans, and it's, uh, you know, the delinquent loans are the ones, the distressed loans are the ones we need to deal with, and that's politically unpopular, you know. They get into, oh, you're helping people who are not paying their mortgages. But the ones that are having trouble paying their mortgages, that's, that's really uh, the diff the, what you need to deal with. And uh, we had suggested uh, during the, the robo-signing uh, debate, uh, we, we'd always been trying to focus on them and getting those, them restructured. And uh, then during the robo-signing debate, we had suggested what we called a super mod, which was a one-time uh, write-down, a principal to appraise value, uh, see if they can start paying the mortgage or do a short sale. Uh, but those, you know, for, for mortgages of a certain date, so, you know, you just pick a date to, uh, and say, you know, anything that's more than 90 days delinquent, those are going to go into foreclosure anyway. Right. So if you can accelerate the losses, that's really why the recovery is so sluggish. So There's still all those unrealized losses out there. Technically, if you had that one one. Uh, time write down, and right. you brought those values. So you, you're basically right. arguing there's a lot of bad debt still on it, banks. Yes, bank take balance the loss. Go ahead and take the losses. Right. Can you give the on the regulator side? When I hear from bankers, is that just flattens them? Yeah. That that you know on 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 uh, um, capital ratios and whatnot. Right. That can the regulators give them ten years or something? Can they <laughs> extend the time to write that off to create an incentive? To, right. to write down to value. Well, that, that is a slippery slope. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the losses really are, are spread out. It's not just on bank balance sheets. A lot of them are in securitization trusts. Frankly, a lot of them are, are, are on the government's books now mm -hmm. through Fannie and Freddie. And, and FHA is, is having some increasing problems. But these, uh, these uh, serious delinquent loans don't get better uh, with time. Uh, usually, you keep kicking down the road. Your losses uh, will, will uh, become more pronounced, uh, not less. So. It's really a matter of whether you rip the Band-Aid off now and clean it out, and I think with that uh, have a more accelerated housing recovery, or you just let people keep, you know, kicking the can down the road and and uh, gradually realizing the losses over time. Uh, I'm, I'm a rip the Band-Aid kind of person, uh, rip the Band-Aid off kind of a person. I think uh, if you look at other uh, economic cycles we've had, it's when people finally take their losses, and that's certainly what we saw during the SNL crisis. That's when you have a real uh, sustainable economic recovery coming so, back. So, I mean, just give us a snapshot of, like, when you say that you're a rip the Band-Aid off kind of person. I, right. It's, it's right. you know, true to yep. form. But in, in today, when you look at the situation, are we, I think one of the problems when you look back at that crisis is you essentially had a complicity behind bankers mm -hmm. and regulators mm -hmm. and others not to do that. Yeah. Are we back in that triangle of not, of not ripping it? And well, I want you yeah. to kind of talk a little bit yeah. about the fiscal situation, because we've had a discussion actually yesterday afternoon where I put to Bob Kimmett and Michael Porter and Steve Case and others, I said, you know, on one hand, we're all here in the press debating government debt. Mm -hmm. And government debt got bigger because mm -hmm. of a private sector debt problem. Yes, it was. And when you look at the private sector debt, we're back at exactly the same level and percentage of GDP basis of uh, private sector debt, 160% of GDP. Um, and, and no one's talking about that. I'm trying yeah. to get people to talk about that, but well. is that a point of worry? <laughs> Well, uh, that's uh, to the extent of shifting on the government's balance sheet is absolutely a, a worry. And uh, I think uh, 
we, uh, we are not on a sustainable uh, fiscal path. We are uh, setting ourselves up for another financial crisis. I think this one potentially more interest rate and, and uh, bond bubble driven than credit driven, uh, which is what we saw in 2008. And, uh, and uh, but that's what happens. But we didn't fundamentally restructure the private banks uh, the, the, the non, uh, and make them and their creditors and their shareholders take the losses. We prop them up. And yes, over time, a lot of that risk is shifting back onto the government balance sheet, which helps the private sector, but it doesn't really help taxpayers. Do you have any interest in uh, being in government again? Not really, no. I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing, yes. It's, and, it's, and when you were to look at, because you, you understand economics well, when you look at the the fiscal situation in the United States and all of your worries about uh, buried problems out there kind of handicap us vis-a-vis -vis Europe. You look at Europe. Yeah, I just you know, got back from Europe. You think Europe is yeah. worse, worse than we are? Yeah, I mean, I will they go yeah. off the cliff before they we are. will? Uh, they are worse. Uh, they do. They have a current sovereign debt problem. It's uneven, obviously. Uh, but it is impairing. Uh, it is uh, it's impairing their 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 uh, banking sector as well, obviously, and their ability to lend. And they're much more reliable on bank reliant on bank, bank credit to support their economic growth than we are, where there are more uh, available uh, areas of, of credit outside the banking sector. So they are worse. I think their political system uh, is also uh, like ours. Uh, lacking from strong leadership, long, lacking from uh, clarity of strategic direction, the ability to build consensus and make decisions and move, it, it's much worse uh, there than it is here. And uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm not optimistic. Even uh, one of the reasons I was over there was to have discussions with the EC on their banking union because there's a lot of interest and need for a resolution authority and a deposit guarantor, uh, similar to the, the type of structure we have here in the U.S. Uh, with the FDIC. And even uh, setting up a banking supervisor with the ECB, which I had thought was kind of a done deal, is now opened again uh, because of these various national interests conflicting with the collective economic interest of, of the European Union. So I think uh, I, that's uh, going to drag on. And again, as here, these problems do not get better with time. Uh, it's getting worse for them. So we have a minute left, and I can't resist asking this, because when you do read the book, again, coming back to this club, you saw Tim Geithner sort of saving Citibank, Larry Summers kind of running his own show, this guy's club. And, you know, the most read article ever in the Atlantic's history is by Anne-Marie Slaughter. Mm -hmm. We just had a good pal of Madeleine Albright's. It wasn't on foreign policy, but it was called Why Women Still Can't Have It All. <laughs> and so I'm interested in whether you yeah. believe we're going to have it all or not have it all. But, right. again, what is it? like and what are the challenges for women when you're at that level of economic policy yeah. brinksmanship yeah and were there issues like that were the, were the were they bullies and did you have to <laughs> yeah there was some bullying i mean i i've been accused of being a bully. i push back you know and people aren't used to that always uh you know and, and sometimes they're, they're surprised and if they have uh, did they pull you aside and say you're not supposed to bully <laughs> They pulled me aside and, and said, well, in, in, in meetings, you know, I wasn't being a team player and I need to get with the program and all of that. And, uh, and I did, actually. I, and, and I think Hank Paulson, uh, we certainly had our disagreements, but I think net, net we had a productive working relationship. But he acknowledges that. I always came to deal. I mean, I didn't – I wanted to work with them. I clearly knew we needed to do something. Uh, but I do think by being at the table and pushing back and pushing back – that we did draw back a lot of the uh, the bailouts and, and made them less generous and with and, and stopped them uh, with the CIT. We, we have said absolutely no to that. So uh, I think uh, it did make a difference. I would also say, though, I, I think uh, you can't get hang up on whether it's because you're a woman or not. I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why people may approach you differently or want to exclude you or whatever. And I think you just need to keep coming back at them and with good arguments. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Sheila Bear. And full by the horns. Yeah, I Thanks. Thank you, Sheila.